This poem is called Light. In the dream, my life was smoke. I couldn't breathe. So I ran, unwrapping myself down the beach till your skin, the ocean, lapped at my knees. I dove in. Your voice was a current, a melody gathering words to itself for us to sing, and we sang them, and they swirled around us, iridescent fish, bringing light to the world you were for me. And then I was water, a river washing the night from your flesh, and I cradled your body rising in me till you were clean, glowing. And when you surfaced, glistening, there was not an inch of you I didn't cling to. Thank you. Um, I was going to read a different poem, but after listening to Mike's poem, you got a lap dance story. I, I, I decided, no, I don't, not a lap dance, but I decided I changed my mind, and I'm going to read. This is a poem called "Working the Dotted Line," and I won't explain. To, you'll know why. Mike's poem. Working the dotted line. I don't remember what vacation I was home for, or how Beth managed to be in New York on the one day we'd have the apartment to ourselves. But I think I recall my mother's hanging crystals scattering the afternoon light in small rainbows that shimmied on the walls and on our skin. And I can still see Beth stretching nervous along the length of the daybed's mattress and my fingers tracing the ridge of her ribs as she tugged at my erection, I'm ready. Let's do it. <laughs> it was her first time, not mine, but it was my first condom and I'd forgotten to read the directions. <laughs> so I stood there growing soft, squinting at the print on the box telling me the step by step I needed to learn was on the inside. I ripped the cardboard open and sat reading on the bed's edge, thumbing the foil-packed, lubricated circle, trying to visualize what I had to do. Beth reached into my lap to ready me again, but when I tore along the dotted line, our protection, like a goldfish taken by hand from its bowl, slipped from my grasp and landed under the desk my mother sat at when she paid the bills. When I picked it up, it was covered with the dust and small particles of dirt that settled daily into all our lives. So I didn't put the next one on till I was kneeling hard between Beth's open legs. She raised herself on her elbows, smiling that the second skin we needed to keep us safe should make me so clumsy. But once I let go of what the instructions called the reservoir tip. I thought of the dams holding water back in the mountains near where she lived and what would happen if they broke. Her smile disappeared. And bunching the sheet beneath her into her fists, she lifted her butt onto the pillow we'd heard would make things easier. I bent for a quick look at where I had to go and climbed up onto her, trying with one hand to be graceful and accurate, and with the other to balance over her without falling. <laughs> at her first grimace, I pulled back. No, she shook her head, eyes clamped shut, and then, staring wide, her voice a whisper through clenched teeth, just do it. Get it over with. <laughs> So I entered her again, trying from the tightness in her face to gauge how hard not to push. But when she cried out anyway, I left her body one more time and crouched over her, my latex-covered penis nosing downward towards her navel, and I placed my palms against her cheek. I cannot hurt you like this. Look. It's going to hurt, she said. There's no other way, and I've chosen you. <laughs> and since I wanted so much to be her choice, I kissed her eyelids and her mouth, and with my eyes buried in the hollow of her neck, moved slowly in till I felt her flesh stop giving way. 
Then, with one arm around her rib cage and the other around her head, holding her tight against my chest, I pulled down and thrust up. In a single motion, I breathed through like I was lifting heavy boxes. She screamed into the muscle just above my collarbone, bit deep into my flesh, and as she bled onto me, I bled. We said nothing afterwards. We didn't cuddle or smile at each other as we dressed or walk hand in hand to the train that took her home. And I did not ask her what her silence meant, nor she mine, but if she had, I would have told her this. My wordlessness was shame. I had no idea how not to hurt her. And I would have told her I wanted it to do over, which is what I tell her even now. Mm -hmm. One more poem from um, The Silence of Men. It's also a love poem, and it's called After Drought. Knees rooted in the bed on either side of your belly, my body is a stalk of wheat bent in summer wind. A bamboo shoot rising, an orchid, and then all at once a cloud swelling, a swallow sculpting air, a freed white dove. You pull me down, but you are hot beneath me, and the gust that is my own heat lifts me away. I'm not ready. Outside, footsteps, voices, two men. Giggling, we pull the sheet around us till they pass, but if someone does see, what will they have seen? A couple making love. No, more than that. They will have seen the coming of the rain, they will have seen us bathe in it, and they will say, Amen. <laughs> so um, I, pu I published this book in April. I have copies if anybody should be interested afterwards. Um, the, the, my new book is called For My Son, A Kind of Prayer. And the poems are all um, about my son or about being a father. Um, and I'll read, I'll read three poems, um, I'll read three poems from here. Um, the first one, uh, four poems from here actually, the first one is called My Son's Theology. And you know, when you have, my son was, I don't know, five, seven years old, you have the God conversation with your children. So this is almost word for word the God conversation I had with my son. My Son's Theology. Shahab asks if I believe in God. I tell him no. He doesn't ask me why. Instead, he tells me God is a dust speck floating on the wind, watching and waving, though we can't see him. And God created nothing, Shahab says, except himself, but he's not lonely and he's not sad. So we laugh, picturing God lounging poolside at some Hollywood superstar's house. We don't discuss God's gender. Cool drink in hand when I ask its orange juice. Of course, God's wearing precisely the gunmetal blue sunglasses Shahab convinced us just last week to buy him for the beach. <laughs> he puts them on now. They're right next to his bed, leans back against the wall and waves. And if you do notice God is there, he says, sitting up straight, raising his eyebrows and smiling, don't be afraid to say hello or give him a high five. <laughs> then my son lifts God's beverage and the generous welcome he imagines diversity, d divinity, he imagines divinity is, and grins. Just make sure he raises his hand first. <laughs> um, when, uh, when my son was, was three or so, <coughs> We used to, we used to, uh, I wrote limericks for him. And, and these limericks were, were very special for him. And so I'd like to share with you, they're in the book, I'd like to share with you these limericks. It's called My Son's Limericks. One. A boy who was wearing red pants went out to dig for some ants. He dug really deep to where the ants sleep. They woke up and crawled into his pants. <laughs> 
two. A boy who was eating his cookie in a house that was creaky and spooky heard a ghost cry out, Boo! He yelled, Boo! to you too. Then he finished his chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Three. A boy sitting up on a wall was bouncing his little green ball. He bounced it so high, he bounced it so high it reached up to the sky and he said, I wish I were that tall. <laughs> Four. The boy in the tree looked down and said to himself with a frown, I've climbed up this high, but I still don't know why. So he stayed till he knew, then climbed down. <laughs> Um, and then my son asked me once, um, he had a dream and he asked me to make a poem from his dream. And so this poem is called, My Son Asks Me to Make a Poem from His Dream. And, and it seems apt for the current political moment in some ways. I met a man in old and tattered clothes walking alone along a moonlit road. His face was black his beard gray, his load, the years that bent his back, the heavy blows of time's hard hammer. His right hand gripped a wooden staff, his left, there was no left, the stump below his elbow, the scars, he'd been whipped, marked him as a thief, and I wondered what theft so old and thin a man could possibly commit to deserve such torture. Out of respect, I did not speak, but when he passed, he spit at me and vainly tried to stand erect. The vision ended there. I went to tell my king, repent or live a living hell. And, and I will read, I'll read one more poem um, that is called It Must Include, it's called It Must Include the Body. And I, I will say only about this poem that I, when I wrote, I thought, after the Supreme Court made marriage equality the law of the land, that this poem would be kind of a, um, just a, a memory of times gone. And given, you know, given that Mike Pence is now our, um, our vice president-elect, it, no it no longer seems that, and so I'd like to read the poem for you. It takes a while to get to marriage equality, but it does get there. <coughs> it must include the body. <coughs> Belly like a watermelon stuffed up the front of her white cotton summer dress. The pregnant woman at the corner turns her back to me to face the direction she'll cross the street in, and what she's wearing flares from the waist down in a twirl that settles along the line of her hips till only the hem that falls to just above her ankles is still rippling, a flag waving surrender to this late summer day. My eyes lift to her shoulders, follow the contour the fabric traces down from the loops through which her tanned arms emerge to the curve of her butt cheeks that bounce lightly as she steps back, just avoiding the taxi that pulls up fast to the curb where she's standing. She's as tall as me or taller, black hair tied tight in a braid pointing like a compass down the small of her back, and her dress is not unlike the one you wore the night we wandered the beach, till the boardwalk lights were stars blinking at our backs, and the campfires scattered across the sand were the signal flames of a distant town. The moon over the ocean cast our shadows behind us. You leaned against me, the blue cloth of what you were wearing bunched just beneath your breasts in my left hand, while my right found you wet, though wet doesn't really do it justice. You half purred a laugh as I stroked and pulled and gently parted the hair you let grow in once the lover who kept you shaved was gone. Lifting your face to mine, you whispered that the breeze was like the water's breath just before it touched its tongue to you. And when I kissed the lips you shaped those words with, you came, calling your pleasure out to the open sea for the wind and tide to carry who knows where. Walking back to our hotel, I thought how you have only ever called it your vagina. Then, later, while you slept, I tried to list the rhyming words I'd need to write a sonnet, but China, 
Carolina, <laughs> trichina, and angina were the best I could do. The off rhymes, Montana, banana, cabana, were no better. But then I heard that New York accent you love to mimic, lina, fina, mina, and reclina. <laughs> That last one bringing back to me the woman from the conference who worried over two more whiskeys than either of us should have had, that three kids had made her roomier down there than any man other than the husband she'd been needing to leave for years would want, and so she hadn't left him. I can't believe I'm telling you this, she said, blushing that the man she planned to make the next night, the only other man ever to touch her, might think he should be moving furniture in down there, not his dick. If a man cares that much about size, I told her, he doesn't deserve an adulterous woman. <laughs> The light turns green, and the mother-to-be who started these lines crosses First Avenue into the rest of her life. The crowd she moves with large enough that the left turn I have to wait for will get me to our son's school even later than the 15 minutes of class he's already missed. But why does George Bush care if two men get married, he asked from the back seat, giving voice yet again to last night's bedtime conversation. I know a man's penis fits a woman's vagina, but that's not love. And people love babies, but babies aren't love. And two women, if they get married, each one can have a baby, but even that's not love. Two men can't. But if they love each other, so what? You don't marry a body, you marry a person. Bush doesn't get this, he's an idiot. <laughs> Our boy takes my hand for the few steps leading up to the building's entrance, letting go, as has become his habit, just shy of the security guard's line of sight. Seriously, he says, when I get home, you need to explain this to me. Then he's running fast as he can past the front desk, arms and legs pumping, backpack swinging from the straps on his shoulders, the long hair that some still take for a girl's bouncing with each stride up around his head. I get it back into the driver's seat, turn the key, put the car in reverse. With my foot on the brake, my eyes in the rear view mirror stare back at me what I know to be true. If you will not love the body, you cannot love the person. I'm grateful our son can't yet imagine that. Thank you so very much.